Well, that takes me to, I mean, how can 24 be a year where you grow sort of the prospect, or you grow the stature of third party? Because, I mean, that's, that's, Great. Is, that, is that part and, of what your role it, is? Exactly, and, and let me tell you, our model for doing this was Massachusetts. Okay. Not that things are perfect, but that it helped me, you know, respond to the, um, the, the requests, the arm twisting for me to get into this race. It helped me a lot to know what we had been able to do at the state level and to have that really as a model. At Massachusetts, I ran, you know, at the statewide level a couple times, knowing it wasn't likely that we were going to be able to win, but that we would change the conversation. And at a time when people are increasingly hitting the wall and hitting the breaking point and are breaking away from the establishment of politics, they are really looking for an alternative. So our most recent legislative election in Massachusetts, uh, our candidate, it was a special election actually for state legislature, our candidate was only 200 votes short of actually winning that election and actually got all of the endorsements from the groups, the environmental, the labor groups, the women's groups, uh, that normally those endorsements would have gone to a Democrat. Well, they're not so much going to Democrats anymore because Democrats have sort of left that agenda behind. Yeah. The Greens have uh, inherited that agenda there's and stood up for it. When you talk in that, in that um, vein, though, I mean, there's a certain fear among progressives that you're, that you're siphoning votes away uh, and strengthening you know, the prospect of... Which is why areas. it's so, so important. How do, you address, how do you address that? We point to exactly what's happened because that viewpoint has really <laughs> prevailed. So many yeah. progressives have muzzled themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we simply point out that this, you know, this silence We've been told, be quiet. This silence has not been an effective political strategy. How is this lesser evil thing working out for you exactly? How's that job? And how's your pay going? And how about your health care? You know, silence doesn't move you forward. Silence is effectively complicity. And silence is a propaganda campaign by the establishment parties who are looking to silence the opposition. That's what they did. And what did we get for it? We learned that the politics of fear is really good at delivering all those things that you're afraid of. Count the ways on the expanding wars, the meltdown of the climate, the collapse of the economy, which still continues to teeter on the brink of collapse, that we have assured those policies by silencing ourselves as the only voice of the public interest. So if you're going to silence the only non-corporate public interest voice out there, you can be sure that what you're going to get is a race to the right by the two corporate sponsored parties and that's exactly what happens so by voting for the lesser evil you effectively guarantee that over the next four years that lesser evil will have adopted all the policies of the greater evil and the greater evil have will, will have gone even further over the cliff that's exactly what happens and you know if that doesn't convince you look at history because how is it that we've actually moved forward? It always takes a social movement on the ground, and thanks to Occupy and students and, and immigrants, we have that movement. It's standing up right now for justice and democracy all over the world, actually, but all over the country as well. We've got a social movement. But throughout history, it has taken a social movement together with an independent political party that can help articulate the agenda and the demands. The social movements don't necessarily do that. They have other work to do. Whereas political parties are very good at articulating agendas and demands and a vision. That's what they're all about. So it's the two together. Social movements working with independent political parties that have made history together. In the abolition movement, there was actually a liberty party that helped drive that issue into political dialogue. In the uh, women's uh, right to vote movement, the women's suffrage movement, there was always the women's party for a uh, worker's right to organize, to unionize, to a 40-hour work week, safe workplaces. That was articulated by the socialists, the labor, and the progressive parties, among others. So it's always been this union. When you're really needing a paradigm shift, when you really need fundamental change, it never comes from the political establishment, which has been corporate sponsored from before the founding of this country. In fact, the power of corporations is not something new. This goes way back when the Tea Party, you know, when the 
Americans held the original Tea Party, you know, in Boston Harbor. That was in opposition to the East India Tea Company, as well as the governor, uh, you know, of the of the, of the colony of Massachusetts and the king. It was about overthrowing aristocracy, but the institution of aristocracy was the, you know, it was the corporation, mm -hmm. and every colony had its own corporation. So, you know, this is a basic American quest for liberty and justice. It's about taking power back. Well, it's about asserting the power that's already there for we the people, uh, as opposed to the corporations who are running the show through their sponsorship right now of the Democratic and Republican parties. They are both equally corporate sponsored. If, I mean, if running, if, if, if the party and also your campaign is to help drive some of these, um, some of these, I guess help drive the discussion, help put some of these issues on the make sure that's part of the discussion. I mean, you talked about certain issues that progressive Democrats say they've taken on that you don't really follow through on, like immigration, like um, like environmental protection, like um, like uh, financial Wall Street reform. But, but what are some of the issues that they haven't touched at all that you think are important that are being completely left out of the conversation? Well, are, are yeah, any, any oh, I mean, God, all over the place, yeah. you know. They have not, for example, addressed the jobs emergency at okay. all. And, and the solutions that they're putting forward are basically more of the same. Obama's stimulus package was mostly uh, corporate tax breaks. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was just a little bit of public works job in there, but not very much, about $100 billion worth, you know, and this was like $800 billion or so uh, of other stuff, mostly being corporate uh, tax breaks. So, you know, we're, the core of my campaign is actually about fixing the economic crisis with a Green New Deal. So this is not hypothetical. It's not some vague, you know, academic idea. This actually has been put to work. Let's, it talk, worked. let's talk about your Green New Deal. Great. Let's go through um, the particulars today. Great. So this would fundamentally create 25 million jobs. It would jumpstart the green economy, which in turn would, uh, you know, put an end to climate change and make wars for oil obsolete. So how are you going to do that? Uh, essentially, it puts communities in charge. It provides national funding, but it's a program which is run at the community level, where communities decide what kinds of jobs they need to become sustainable, not just environmentally, but also socially and economically. So. If communities need teachers, and probably they do, because 300,000 have lost their jobs, you know, then then that is that's part of the Green New Deal is rehiring teachers, nurses, childcare, after school, senior care, home care, uh, violence and drug abuse prevention, affordable housing. But so too are the classical green jobs, and that means clean renewable energy and conservation. It means weatherizing our homes, businesses, and schools, which could put easily a million people to work overnight on that weatherization program. We have a program that would run circles around the Keystone Pipeline, which is not going to be many jobs, and it's jobs that will make us sicker and less sustainable and more, you know, more and more uh, uh, in deep trouble on, on climate change. We can create jobs that actually make our communities healthier, more sustainable, and more just. So clean energy is part of it. A healthy, relocalized, organic food supply which will provide for food security and food justice in this day and age where, you know, where the industrial food system is a devastating health issue. Witness these skyrocketing, you know, uh, rates of obesity and, and diabetes and all the rest, uh, and asthma and, and many other uh, related diseases. Um, you know, but also uh, a food system is urgently needed that is secure, especially in light of climate change, in light of fuel insecurities, because as you know, the whole food system right now is very dependent on fossil fuels and, uh, and high water inputs and all these things that make our current food supply extremely precarious. The costs are going way up, you know, with drought and with um, the rising cost of fuel and all that. So we need local food. Uh, and, and secure food systems, uh, as well as public transportation, which is fuel efficient and which incorporates activity so that we've got bike paths and safe sidewalks and kids can walk to school and people can bike and so on. That begins to create also the infrastructure for a true health care system as opposed to a disease care system, which is what we actually have now. You know, and, and we're spending two trillion dollars a year on this disease care system, which is not making us healthier. It just kind of keeps us running faster and faster, going more and more bankrupt, 
uh, basically while we're getting sicker, in fact. So the Green New Deal is a win-win-win. It's a win for jobs, it's a win for jump-starting the green economy and solving climate change, and it's also a real win for our health. Because once you have a healthy food system and an active transportation system and you have built-in pollution prevention because you're no longer fossil fuel dependent for energy and chemicals and all that, um, you, you're basically preventing about 75% of the uh, costs of our so-called healthcare system right now, where we're spending $2 trillion a year. So this is a huge win for our uh, budget as well. And the last thing I'll mention is that the Green New Deal includes public works and public services, like when we think of the, Green, of the New Deal from the 1930s, we usually think of these public works. So you would have, instead of an unemployment office, you'd have an employment office. Instead of going down to collect your unemployment check, you'd go down to the office to get a job and collect a check you know, and, and your benefits for actually earning a living and a living wage while you're making your community and the nation and the planet healthier, more just and sustainable. The Green New Deal includes also small businesses and worker cooperatives because at the end of the day we don't want to have to depend on public works and public services to jumpstart the economy. We want to get an economy going which is then self-sustaining. And to do that, we need small community-based enterprises which provide for the needs of our communities. Um, and, and then just to, yeah, I, I won't elaborate on it, but just to mention, the Green New Deal contains financial reforms so that we can be sure we have the capital to invest. The cost, by the way, I the financial reforms? Great. So, um, for starters, uh, we would ask the rich to step up to the plate and start paying their fair share. The rich and, and corporations. Corporations, uh, after World War II, were number paying... Number that we're looking at. Uh, a number? Yes, sure. Yeah. So, uh, a Wall Street transaction tax would easily generate $200 billion a year. Depending where you put the number, it could be $300 billion. Uh, capital gains very much needs to be taxed as income because it is the chief source, really, of the high end, the total off the charts, you know, earnings of the hedge fund managers and so on. They need to be paying like working people. So capital gains would in turn uh, deliver hundreds of billions a year. Uh, offshore tax havens should be taxed as well. That might be a hundred billion. Uh, large estates need to pay a tax. Again, they're you know, virtually paying nothing. And, and corporations need to pay their fair share. They used to be paying about the equivalent of 5 to 6% of GDP. Now they're paying about 1%. Yeah. So you know, the, uh, a lot of the loopholes need to be closed and so on. So that money can be brought in. The other financial reforms we talk about, though, is, is uh, breaking up the banks that are too big to, be, to fail that are still too big to fail, which have not fundamentally been reformed, which still put us at risk for having to provide them trillions and trillions more bailouts, and it could be next week, you know, if, if Europe goes under, which which really, to show us how much, you know, how effective uh, the Democrats and Congress, and the Democrats had Congress for two years, you know, they did have a majority and nothing got done on this. So the banks need to be broken up, and in turn we need to have uh, public banks at the state level, uh, we need to nationalize the Fed, and uh, we also need municipal banks so that that money is available for small businesses as well as uh, for state governments and municipal governments to get the loan.